Howdy, howdy, y'all. I'm Curtis Sunset. And I'm Leo Halston. And, and this is Weathery Rainbows. Rainbows. <sighs> well, howdy, howdy, Miss Halston. Let's go for a walk on the Rainbow Trail. Oh, no. The last time you forgot the umbrellas and got us into a whole heap of trouble. I won't forget this time. Let's go. <laughs> to weather the rainbows howdy howdy y'all and welcome back to weathering rainbows uh i'm your host curtis sunset and here's your other host i'm leah holston <laughs> so we were super tame the last episode we had a very special guest uh lieutenant colonel brief ram so we tried to maintain some like aspect of super professional we failed but not too bad uh, mm -hmm. so, but this one we're gonna you know we can talk about whatever so uh let's talk more on pride and some yes. maybe some stories yes um first off oh, congratulations just, thank you thank um, you because what happened to you this pride pride kickoff over at chill um you know we had the lieutenant <laughs> governor i got presented well cadillac and i got presented um Kentucky Colonel uh, certificates, which is uh, actually a super huge deal. Yeah. Um, and what makes it more uh, a bigger deal is that uh, normally when they present you with that certificate, it's in your legal name. Cadillac and I are the first ones to have it in our drag name and our stage wow. name. So I have a huge plaque in my living room um, from uh, Andy Bashir and uh, Lieutenant uh, Lieutenant Governor. Is it Jackie Coleman? That's it. Uh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline Coleman. Hey, Jacqueline, girl. How you doing? <laughs> it was a super am amazing moment. And the, all the news teams were there. Um, speechless. I, Because, I, I, you know, I've won pageants. And I think this is a high honor. You know, especially for me. Not, you know, you know, this is home for me now. But I'm not from here. And, you know, but, you know, I love the community and I love this, this, uh, this little town, big town, whatever y'all want to call it. Um, and I mean, I was just like speechless when it happened. So the only thing that could come out of my mouth was, um, so does this mean I get to go into KFC and get all the chicken I want? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what it means, but... You could try. <laughs> uh, yes, I need a small necklace version of my certificate. So when I walk in, uh, but apparently, like people are supposed to salute salute you. You know, I don't know. So now, when I'm at the bar, I'd be like, "I'm a colonel. Salute me, bitch." <laughs> you have to salute her. <laughs> oh. Well, I was at uh, the chill bar kickoff, but uh, I got there late and you got all upset with me. Oh, but... I did. Cause <laughs> I was like, what a special moment you missed. Okay. I thought it started at eight o'clock because I'm pretty sure you told me eight, but <laughs> I got oh, there at like seven 30 and you're like, you're late. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. typical, typical male blaming <laughs> it on the wife. That's, that's how they do it. Y'all. <laughs> I know That's, I told you the right time. You were just you trying to get did. cute for your I, little date. Uh, uh, special guest, I'm sorry. Your special guest. You was <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, the special guest didn't even get to come because of all the flight cancellations. That's right. What a horrible so, mess that was, though. Oh, my goodness. Like, it was two days in a row, like, they canceled yeah. his flights. I, I mean, crazy. So... So, I'm sure we're going to do something in the future, but uh, <laughs> we had this surprise where the runner-up of the, like, 
online gay boyfriend show was also yeah. there. And like Chris Stanley did not know that he was going to be there. So like we yeah. were just going to have him like sitting in the room. And then when Chris Stanley opens it up, he was going to be like, what? These thighs weren't good enough for you? you right. Know, like something. And so, I'm going to confess because like, I, you know, when we interviewed Chris, I, I liked him. He was like, you know, super sh- shy and but like mm-hmm. interesting so i was like okay so i was like okay i get to meet him in person and then when you were like his flights canceled i was like mm, did it <laughs> so you I know me was, you know you know me i said let me do some research here mm-hmm. let me get online and call all my friends and see what's going on because <laughs> curtis probably, that boy probably be scared of curtis and mm-hmm. you know i was like he don't want to come up here and blah 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 so I said, let me do some research. But it was true, Chris. The flights yeah. were canceled. It was, I mean, the that was horrible for everybody yeah. in, the, in the travel industry. It yeah. was really horrible. And it's still happening. Like, there's so many flights oh, yeah. just getting canceled constantly. Yeah. Well, because but, they don't uh, have uh, crews and people are, you know, I used, to mm-hmm. fly, I used to be a flight attendant. So, you guys, you don't understand, um, like, crews, we can only fly so many hours and then we time out. If I'm at my eight hour if there's a if it's a if it's a six crew and one flight attendant um times out the whole plane whole flight gonna cancel so wow. if you got a six member crew and everybody is good on time and then you have one flight attendant that's hitting their eight hours and the flight haven't taken off yet it's over the wow. flight gonna cancel because that flight didn't have to go get after that eight hours you have to get rest you have to get right. a minimum amount of rest so um yeah. i wish he would have made it we had we we de- you definitely were missed chris and we had a good time yeah no i definitely uh was the exact same i was like did we talk too much kinky <laughs> stuff or like did, did we did we mess this up and uh but but i was like he sent me his flight number before all of it started canceling so i was like that was a good move because otherwise I'd have been like, he's making this up. I, so. I, for, I forgot we did grill him, so he probably well, was scared of me. He probably was. <laughs> so, but no, I talked to him. He was excited. I mean, it's it's a shame he didn't get to come, but we will do something in the future uh, with him. So, uh, that being said, um, we had some questions. Uh, people came to our vendor booth and would like to submit random questions. Um, so I pulled some of the better ones uh, out of this, and we are going to answer three of those on this show. Okay. Um, so the first question that was submitted, um, can you give us advice on how to approach a guy? I mean... So I, will, I will say this, because like <laughs> for me, it's very difficult. So I understand where this question is coming from, because like I'm honestly like, don't don't tell a lot of people, but I'm like crushing on this like guy that works at Menards because I've been going there so frequently and like, like, but I can't approach him and be like, Hey, are you gay? You know? So like, how do you approach a guy? We need sound effects. When are you not crushing on somebody? <laughs> oh my God. We need sound effects for that. I got, like you know, for my it's... look like crazy. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, that's a tough situation because I mean, I, I definitely can understand that because I'm at the hospital and I see doctors and nurses. I'm like, ooh, yes, damn, you know, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. But the only thing you can do is, like, walk up and have a conversation. And the, the first thing you need to do, the first thing you need to do is go and start the conversation. You're you're at Myers. You said Myers? Menards. Menards. I've been working oh, outside. Save, oh, save <laughs> good money at Menards. Yes. <laughs> It's all about um, that rebate. <laughs> <laughs> I need to trap that. Honey. Uh, we need a rap version. Uh, so with it being a store, you have it easy, Curtis, because you could just walk up and be like, hey, um, what Al is blah, blah, blah. Or, and then after that, oh, uh, you know, how long you been working here? Like, you know, it's easy for you. you I uh, mean, a store, it's easy. Anything in a store. Yeah. I've even, I'm going to tell you, I'm bold. I'm a bold bitch. I'm going to tell y'all. I've seen guys walking or jogging at the park and I'll be like, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Lynn Street? <laughs> <laughs> how do I get there? You want to come with me? <laughs> right. You know, the, you got to spark up the conversation. You just can't, because if you continue just to look and 
and and wish and hope, yeah. it's, it's never gonna happen. So you either, I know me, I hate reject, I I hate rejection. Yeah. So I get in my feelings and then I get over it, you know. But you got to start somewhere. You got to put your best foot forward and be like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this, you know. Yeah. Um, I think you know, like Curtis, for you me, could be like, I'm working on this project. What are your What are the tools? You know, can you help me put this together? Like, find the tool. That's the best thing. Go find a project that has a lot of tools and be like, Hey, I'm building this. I need you to help me find the tools. And then when he helped me he, find find the tools, did, you just dish the basket once. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the tool I was searching for, Mister. Uh, <laughs> Well, you got to you got to start with that to get the tool you want. No, here's the other thing. Like I would probably if he was a a gay man, I would probably expect him not to know like all the tools and stuff. I mean, but I know there are some now. like super like yeah, butch gay men, but you he don't look now. super butch, so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see you where think, that one goes. You think you think he's family or you know what 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 is it mm-hmm. about him that, you know, and there's always that like little flair are you just that opinion. creepy person walking through the thing and just looking at him <laughs> down every aisle? Please tell me you're not that person. No, because he's always at the entrance because <laughs> he's like dealing with like the uh, like things that you take back and stuff. So oh. maybe I need to take something back. That's not just good, something. Go buy like a like, bunch of nails or, and or, <laughs> or bolts or stuff and because he got to count. Little. He got to count each one of them. So yeah. Oh and goodness. Just do like a week of just returning stuff and be like, uh. This didn't work. That's how you spark up a conversation. And be like, oh, I'm trying to build this dog house. <laughs> and you got a cat. Oh, goodness. Yeah, and I got a cat. That, that would be a great conversation later uh, on. So my advice to the to that question is if you're listening, um, build, you know, it not sit not necessarily walk up and be like, hey, I like you, blah, blah, blah. Find something, you know, hey, you know, um, if it's you know, I don't know if the person work in the store or if you've seen the person at the restaurant uh, or you just see the person jogging. Um, you got to find some way to spark up a conversation. And, you know, either it's going the conversation going to go or they going to be like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're going to know pretty quick, I think. Yeah. And, but I think there's like you you brought up a good point, like just randomly meeting somebody out. Yeah. Um, I get questions all the times when I'm like at like bars about how to approach guys. And yeah. one of the things that I always, the, the best advice that was ever given to me was people want to bo- like you want to be bothered. Like that's the whole yeah. reason of going to the bar. So yeah. like, if like go up to them and talk to them because it shows like confidence. And that's one of the like biggest like turn ons for people is just like the confidence to go up and say hi. So like, <laughs> Go up and say hey, and just carry on a conversation. And yeah, I, I think that's just the best way to do it. A bar so. is easy because you could just walk up and be like, "Hey, nice shoes. Where you get those from?" I think mm-hmm. you know, blah blah blah. I mean, there's so many things you could start off with. Oh, what is that? What you drinking? Okay, mm-hmm. I think I'm gonna drink that. You want me to buy you one too? You know, you got it. The bar is like so mm-hmm. easy. That's why I always tell people you got to wear a what I call a what's it at a bar. Mm-hmm. Like, which is like, you know, a necklace or something <laughs> like give people the chance to come approach you and say something nice about something random and unique about you. Like, that's that's my trick. That's how I get guys. So, I, so I would tell y'all back in the day, I used to like write uh, notes and leave. On, I'll find out what kind of car the person was driving. Uh, I would write a note and leave it on their car. Uh, I've even gone to the point where, you know, I walk up to a guy and be like, uh, I'll be like, uh, Joe, oh, <laughs> you look like my friend, Joe. You look just like oh. my friend, Joe. <laughs> and they'd be like, no, I'm not Joe. And I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, now that I see that you're not Joe, uh, yeah, Joe, I used, to suck, I used to suck Joe's dick. <laughs> that's how you get, that's how you get him. <laughs> See, that's, I would be the person that would be like, so what's Joe look like? Because I need to know if he's like attractive or not attractive. So show me and a picture. See, and see, that's how, and that's how, and that's how you start a conversation. Like, yeah. I mean, even if I, 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 if I see him jogging, I'll ride, roll down the wind and be like, Will, oh, I thought you was my friend <laughs> Will, boo. Oh, I'm sorry. You look good though. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go on to this next question. Um, what is your favorite fruit slash 
this one's a I just thought it was funny. <laughs> have you ever done anything sexual with a fruit? It's like there's all the movies that have like the apple pies and the first peaches. of all first of all, I don't do nothing with no fruit <laughs> but eat it. I don't do nothing with no yeah. vegetable but eat it. Like mm-hmm. I ain't never been that person to do nothing with no fruits or vegetables. So no, I'm not I'm not that desperate, honey. I got five dildos in the in the room. <laughs> I don't need no yeah. fruit. Oh uh, yeah. I, I mean, think we're both going to be boring on that one. I have not either, but like peaches are definitely my favorite fruit by far. Um, and not I just because I like the innuendo. I hear this a lot. They say if you eat pineapples, your, you know, cream tastes like pineapple. Well, is I, that I, I've true? heard it tastes better. And I actually, I do believe that that is true. Um, like studies have shown, I, I mean, I want to know who completes these studies. I don't know <laughs> who's doing the taste testing, but, uh, I don't know, but know. I'm gonna finish eating this pineapple. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Come on. I'm gonna oh, my my taste sweet. Whew. Um, no, I've never done anything with a fruit, like fruit. I mean, I've back in the day, I love that I'm. All my stories are back in the day. <laughs> back in the day, I used to put an ice cube in my mouth and suck on a little nipple or something. <laughs> look, look, okay. How did we go from fruit to this? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Maybe <laughs> they say fruit, and I don't do I don't do nothing with no fruit. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. but eat it. Yeah. I mean, the best I I do with fruit is like send emojis that mean dirty things. Like that's the most sexual I get with, I guess, fruit. So, (laughs) but uh, all right, let's go into the final question for from Pride uh, on this episode. Um, Molly asks, "Do you feel if you would have stayed secretive, would life be easier?" I thought that was a really good question. That's on Uh, you. Honestly, for me. Overall, my answer is no, absolutely not. Like, I think being true to yourself is is by far, you have to eventually do that or you are going to live a miserable, miserable life. And I think yes. a lot of our interviews and people that have came out late in life have shown that, uh, that you eventually just grow so miserable that you have to come out. Yeah. Uh, now, that being said, like, would it would life be easier? I think in certain circumstances... Uh, It's a rarity, but in certain circumstances, like it can make life easier for a small time period. So like if you're young, like you don't need to come out if you've got a very unaccepting family or like if your work environment is horrible or hates LGBTQ people, but you've got to make an income for a little bit of time before you can find another job. Like, yeah, those kind of times. Yes. But other than that, overall, heck no. Yeah. What's your thoughts? I I agree. (laughs) Um. I mean, I I don't even know how to even reply to that because, like, I've been living my truth, you know, Mm -hmm. since I was seven, eight, six, you know. So I've always been out. There's no secret here. I was I was 20 before I came out, and so I was straight all through high school and Mm -hmm. had girlfriends and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, Mm -hmm. it just it doesn't work. And I think. For me, like you end up hurting people. Uh, oh yeah, that you shouldn't. And yeah, um, so like, no, it, it's it doesn't make life easier in the long run by far. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, that is three of our questions that were submitted from Pride. We're going to do this one more time in a future episode uh, and answer some of your all's questions. Uh, we appreciate everybody that stopped by the booth, um, and hopefully, y'all got some various pins and stickers. I didn't get a and... chance to meet anybody from the booth because I was busy. You were busy. You were yeah. up in that tent all all day. I'm gonna need so. you to have a cardboard cut out of me. Uh, you should see the. We had a really cool poster of you. Oh, really? So, yeah, I and I never. You, you never gave me my T-shirt. I still have your T-shirt. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it was a special T-shirt made for you, and you did not uh, get it, which is typical of me to not give you something. <laughs> All right. In this episode, though, we do have um, speaking of Pride, uh, they had one of the first ever Owensboro like little Pride celebrations at the River Ooh. Park Center. Um, and that was, uh, I unfortunately didn't get to go cause it was also the same weekend as, 
uh, Kentucky Anna Pride. Yeah. Um, but this interview is with one of the people that helps with that um, and has really helped the Pride community uh, in Owensboro. And uh, it is this our first ever mother-daughter duo for an interview. Yes. Um, uh, we have uh, Jennifer Richardson and Kaylee Logston. Uh, Kaylee uh, is a transgender uh, woman that talks a lot about the health aspects and stuff like that. So I'm pretty excited to get into this interview and hope you are too. So with that, let's kick it over to Jennifer and Kaylee. Howdy, howdy, y'all, and welcome back to the interview portion of Weathering Rainbows, where we get to interview some cool people out doing some amazing things for the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, today, we have a special treat because we're not just bringing you one person, we're bringing you two. Uh, we have Jennifer Richardson, who is the mother of Kaylee Logston. Uh, Kaylee is a transgender a uh, female that uh, has a very great story because she's from the South and she's a Southern transgender woman. And that's that's obviously going to be an amazing story. And they're, they've already showed themselves to me as very sassy, wonderful people. So I'm going to pitch it over to you all to introduce a little bit about yourselves uh, and we'll go from there. My name is Kaylee Logston and I use uh, the pronoun she, her, hers and they, them, theirs. And as Curtis said, I am originally from the South. Um, currently, uh, we are on a, a little bit of a vacation. We're on a mother-daughter vacation, so we get to spend some time together. But otherwise, um, I'm actually currently living in Rhode Island. So I am in the part of the north that my mother affectionately calls the Yankee Village. Um, so I'm up there um, working full time, but it's really awesome to be able to kind of come and see her and also to kind of share a little bit of our story. So um, I'll let her take it from here. Uh, thanks for inviting us on. It's great to share our story. Uh, I feel it's important to really share uh, with other moms and daughters who might be going through the process all the struggles that we went through and to know that at the end of the journey that there is really a rainbow and that there is happiness and that there is fun and uh and a lot of funny stories a lot of oh, funny yeah. stories <laughs> uh a lot of uh we went through a lot together but let's start out with one of the, one of the most unique things about transgender individuals to me is that they have to almost always come out twice. They've normally first come out as gay and then later on they are more fully accepting. They've learned sexuality and gender and they've learned these things that was not taught to them growing up and they start to understand more about themselves. Can you give us a little bit about your story and your coming out process? Yeah. So uh, a little bit about my story. Um, I am one of those individuals that did the coming out twice. So nice. I did it twice. Uh, I put her through uh, coming out as gay. And then I was like, hold on, rain check. Got another thing for you. Uh, <laughs> so when my, my coming out really, uh, really kind of happened when I was 18. So it was much later in life uh, for sure. So when I was a kid, uh, growing up in the South, I feel like, um, especially in, in Kentucky, I didn't really have um, some role models. I didn't really have those um, individuals in our community um, that were in, like, just in and around my school or things like that. And so for the longest time, I had no conceptual understanding of what is gay, what is trans, um, I just knew that things didn't feel right. And um, sometimes you don't have the words to be, be able to describe how you feel. And so whenever I turned 18, um, I was watching, well, up until this point, I was also watching a lot of Will and Grace at the time. That's my fault. <laughs> That's her fault. <laughs> um, yeah, she also, there was a lot of Ellen in the house. Um, she was very adamant about like, like whatever daytime TV that kept me occupied. So it didn't matter yeah. what was on. Um, it just happened to be that those were the primetime TV shows when I was born. But that was my fault that she was gay because I allowed that. <laughs> right. You, you inundated her. That's, that's what happened. <laughs> 
so um so i did i i did kind of catch up on like little glimpses but you know when you had shows like jerry springer who were like surprise like there's this person that is like quote unquote a tranny or a transvestite you know it really kind of demonizes on top of being sometimes in a space where you know again there's a lot of like not known education around the topic, around how to support people, let alone um, sometimes there's there's just not inclusive people. And um, so I grew up kind of a little bit in the dark here. And so whenever I turned 18, I started going to college. Um, and I found that college was really the, like the space where I got to do a lot of identity exploration. And so when I was... Um, when I was about 21, I came out as gay. Um, and all of a sudden, I miraculously had style. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got nice haircuts. We invested yeah. in ourselves. That's good. Yeah. It's, it just, it's, it's a miracle. It happens overnight. I get it. <laughs> it's like you just look in the mirror and you're like, dear God, did someone let me leave the house and like, blue jean shorts with the pockets like mm -hmm. i don't know <laughs> so um so it wasn't until like actually i was a full-time working professional um did i come out as transgender so when i went to graduate school i started doing some really dev like heavy deep dives into gender and then i realized i was like oh it's an and thing like i got it queer and trans like um, all of those things. And so that's a really quick summary of, of my story, but I know that we're going to get into a lot of, uh, a lot of the nitty gritty, funny details for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. as a mother, what I see as style or what have you is, which, uh, I hate to use a dead name, but I feel like wanting to blend in. It was always gray, black, navy, nothing that ever stood out. So that's what I see as a mom. And there is right. and after you bloomed as a gay man, uh, I see that's when like graduation was the finest suit you ever seen in your life. It was a green <laughs> suit that was super fly. So uh I had a thing for Paisley. It was great. <laughs> uh, and, and and in the high school would have never wore that a period mm -hmm. but Kaylee mm -hmm. as a woman that was you know I watching her bloom as a woman was was it was hard for me to accept I think that was harder for me to accept Kaylee as a transgender woman than it was uh as a gay man and and I really don't know why really other than I had to grieve that process of, of losing that son but yeah. um Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that. Obviously, uh, you had to experience the coming out twice, um, and you've had to experience the full transition, everything that comes along with that. Um, as a mother, can you kind of walk us through that process for you? Because you're the first mother that's actually been on our show to kind of give that experience and tell that tale. Um, so kind of just start from the beginning whenever uh, came out as gay, and then go go into the second coming out and all those things that you experienced. So, uh, I knew, uh, Kaylee was gay, knew it, knew it for some time, just because there was, there was things thrown at the wide left and right. And, you know, uh, prior years from probably, probably about the age of 12 on up, I knew that Kaylee was gay. Try to not believe it at first because, you know, you don't necessarily in the South want that, those barriers for your child, that, that all, all that comes, all the stigma, right. the bigotry, the hatred, because people are awful. The hate that comes along, uh, you don't want that for your child. And then the, um, the, the religious aspect. You know, the, what you have to deconstruct from re, the religious act, aspect in uh, the Southern Baptist faith is, is really hard. Uh, and, of course, that, that had to happen. And, you know, I had to take on that myself. 
and deconstruct all that myself and know that, you know, beyond everything, that the higher power is love. And as a mother, I have to be that unconditional love. And that's what I wanted to be. And I always want to be what I say I am and live up to that as a mother. And provide that unconditional love as hard as it is. You know, they, I'm not saying it was easy. Gosh, it was not. I, I think the, the transgender part was the hardest for me. I mean, I went to therapy. I'm like, there's a lot of grief. I had anxiety. It was rough. I cried. I was looking. I'm a, I'm a sociology and psychology major. I was good. You know, I was doing research, looking at statistics about how much of the gay population is actually transgender and trying to apply all this, these, these statistics to my real life. And it didn't fit. You know, the probabilities right. did not fit. I'm like, OK, we just have to throw that out the window and love her through everything and just know that Kaylee is Kaylee and, and just love her. And, you know, I think my biggest advice to mom is don't be afraid to lean on your therapist, to seek out that help. And, you know, and I, I had to write, you know, I wrote that letter to say in goodbye. And that was, that was hard. And, you know, it, yeah. you know, to say goodbye, because, you know, as a male, having that one son in your life, there's like an emblem of strength there that I had to say goodbye to. And, and I, I don't know how to explain it. Other than, you know, I had to put to, to say goodbye to that. But that was not going to be there for me. And, you know, just accept that, you know, I was going to have three daughters and that I was never going to have children, biological grandchildren from Kaylee. I had to let that go. Not that that, that blood matters, because in my family, you should see us. It, it shouldn't matter and it doesn't matter in our family. Uh, but I had to let that go. It was just a huge grieving process. Uh, and it took me about six months, uh, not that I ever turned my back on her, because I, I didn't, you know, from the day, from the day she said she was gay, I'm, I hugged her and said, I will love you through anything, because that's what real love is, is loving you through anything, and providing that unconditional love, uh, not saying that it, it wasn't a struggle up to that point, because I seen it from the time she was 12 to the time she came out, you know, deconstructing yeah. all those religious views, uh, because, you know, in the Baptist faith, that's a very harsh. One thing I've, uh, I always like to talk about is, for instance, with us, whenever we come out, we a lot of times don't hear the whispers in the background. You know, we have people that are very blunt and brutal to us just in real life. But in terms of our families, there's a lot of whispering going on. There's a lot of talking going on in the background that, that we don't necessarily hear that someone who is not gay who is not transgender, has to be an ally, has to be the advocate that speaks up for us in those moments. Uh, Jennifer, did you have those experiences, and how did you convey that to the other family members and the other community members that were doing the whispering? Well, as far as the whispers, I guess I, I somewhat have a strong personality. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, and, and my true friends were there for me to lean on and, and help me. My true friends were there for me to cry on their shoulder and help walk with me. And, you know, my true, my, one of my very best friends, you know, she had reservations about the LGBT plus community. Because she's very, uh, has a strict Catholic, you know, cradle Catholic faith. But her and her husband, because they are so closely connected to my family, have come very accepting of Kaylee and now have no problem calling Kaylee Kaylee, even though they've known her since she was a very baby, a uh, very small child, uh, which is just phenomenal knowing uh, that, you know, her, her husband and her come from a very different background. So that just shows me that exposure and, and, and education and that open-mindedness matters so very much. Uh, now, I've, I had 
people that I went toe to toe with still to this day. I mean, I blocked somebody oh, yeah. the other day on Facebook. They posted a nasty transgender meme and I put underneath it, uh, I love my transgender daughter, giving them space to think about what they had posted. And then they posted something else and unfriended them. Then they sent me a little message. Why? You know, we're not friends anymore. What's up? I'm like, well, you know, you're free to think and believe however you want, but I do not have to create a space on my news feed for your bigotry. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and I would I would also add like as mom was going through her own process, I think something that's unique that we don't talk about as transgender people because we're so worried that people will demonize us for it is that it's okay to not be a hundred percent certain or um or to not know like what comes next Mm -hmm. i think sometimes like when we transition we sometimes think oh well i don't know what i'll i I can't imagine what i'll look like in 70 years i have affirmed that i will look hot and i don't care but (laughs) but um but you don't know those things there's so many unknowns that that exist and so there's always going to be a little bit of doubt and where sometimes these whispers come in it's like oh well you know, are you a hundred percent sure? Do you even know all these different things? And I'm like, well, changing gender is not like changing a pair of pants. It's not like going to the store and picking out a pair of pants. Like, and let me tell you, as now a woman picking out pants and trying to figure out the right size, ridiculous. I need, thir- I, I, I wish I had the sizes at least. I, I wish I had the actual inches because that makes sense in my brain. Um, but instead, it's a guessing game. Um, but that being said, throughout that whole process too, you're entitled to have your own sense of grief. Yeah. And if you if you have a family member, it's important for each to go through their grieving process individually so that you're not putting your trauma and you're not putting your own grieving process on your kid or on your, on your parent of like, there is something fundamental of how do you negotiate your identity? Because there is a bit of like, Everything that I once knew who I was is shifting and it's turning upside down and it's okay to be a little bit sad by that Um, and what that could mean. Um, But it's also really exciting too, because I tell people all the time, it wasn't that I hated who I was. It was, I wanted something more. And um, I didn't know what that more was until I started dipping my toe in and trying to find it. And I, I call that that breadcrumb trail of happiness of you just do a little bit each day and you get closer to where you want to be and whatever that means for you. Yeah. I, right. I guess I can't really say that there was a lot of people and I guess it's because that so of my personality, uh, anybody that knows me, that, that knows who I am, that if I believe in something, it's head on yeah. walls, walls for, <laughs> lack, for lack of better words. And uh, yeah. I'll go to toe to toe who with whoever. So I, I don't, I didn't have a lot of pushback other than uh, my ex-husband, you know, he, he, he abandoned Kaylee uh, and that's okay because, you know, you know, the people who, who are who really love you will love you through the hard spots in life. Yeah, that's 100% true. So, Kaylee, one thing I will, I, I, you wrote in here about the, basically the loss of male privilege. And that is something that I've never heard anyone bring up on our show. Um, and that's something I want you to kind of address because that, that's such a big point in transitioning that a lot of people don't even think about. So can you address that? Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole big bunch about it. Um, <laughs> like I was like, at one point I was like, I'm going to write a dissertation on this. And I was like, no, I love myself and my time more. Um, <laughs> I do. Um, so for me, like losing male privilege is something that happens over time. It's, it's very interesting because it's not just like overnight. You're like, boom, hi, here I am whatever. Um, but it's the slow erosion of, of a life that you were used to. And so you start to be like a little bit more hypervigilant and it comes like whenever you get catcalled, when you walk down the street, 
or it happens when uh, because it's like it's and you get in this weird space of like, wow, that's affirming, but also really scary um, because you don't know how people would react. And so the the loss of male privilege is something that um, I think fuels a lot of the transgender discourse, especially around bathroom bills and a lot of uh, trans sports is because people can't fathom me existing because my existence alone refutes what male privilege does. I had, I actually, my transition said, no, thank you. I don't want all the benefits that come with being a man. I would rather be a woman. And that pokes holes and how people understand like, oh, well, being a guy is great. You get like in all these things that people take for granted. It highlights what people don't want highlighted. And that's what um, that's what becomes so contentious. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, if people can't consume or, or, or enjoy or, you know, be in my company, let them choke. Um, I don't <laughs> care. I don't care. Yeah. I will not break myself down into bite sized pieces. You can choke. Um, and so that is something that I've encountered of like this just loss of male privileges. It's the slow erosion of, I've even had, um, in context with like professional organizations, um, where I've gone into rooms and people have not known that I'm trans. And then they read me as a woman, which is entirely the goal, right? Um, but yeah. then you'll have, uh, you'll have someone that like over talks you or something like that. And for you to not have that socialization when you were a kid of like, this is what mothers teach their little girls of like, like, you know, little boys, men are going to over talk you. Here's how you make your presence known. And so when people sometimes come face to face with me in organizations, they can't comprehend why I'm not following in line with, with how people are traditionally socialized. I'm like, nope. I'm like, I did not magically get dumber because I took estrogen. Um, I did not. It's astounding. You may have gotten smarter. From it. <laughs> right. Like, you were like, wow. Like, you had this idea? Like, I would have never guessed. And I was like, girl, please. Girl, please. <laughs> I, I love that. That is a great explanation. I, I think something that we rarely highlight on the show, uh, but to even think about having that process of, of losing, you know, the male privilege of all the things that come along with that. And, you know, it's, it, that's why it's privilege. We don't realize it until we go through something like that. And, you know, there's a lot of different types of privileges, but that's one that has constantly been near the top of, the food chain or however you want to put it. So, and, and I would just say too, like I, I tell people the loss of privilege, it isn't as bad as you think it is um, to lose your privilege. And I sometimes think of like, what would the world look like from a social justice perspective if people lost more of their privilege? And like, if we were able to understand what that loss of privilege looks like, what might we give up a little bit more and be a little bit more uncomfortable with? in order for other people to make space for and expand. So true. Well, I can already tell that you're a great advocate, um, but I know that you have spent a lot, a great deal of time uh, in the healthcare equal access fields. Can you talk a little bit about your journey there? Yeah. So my journey really came as a result of, I started transitioning when I was in Arizona. Um, at the time when I was in my first professional job and I found it really challenging because in Arizona, the healthcare is pretty similar to the landscape of what we would see in like Kentucky and other parts of the South where there's a lot of gatekeeping, especially around hormones and getting access to appropriate mental health care is just really, really challenging. And so that's kind of where my advocacy journey began is with myself um, because I was out in Arizona by myself. And so I was like, well, if I'm going to figure this out, I've got to figure it out for myself. And so it started off with my journey. And then over time, um, as I've gotten further along in my transition, you know, that has involved like 
hormone replacement therapy that has involved um, surgical interventions. And so every step of the way, it's been trying to figure out how do you get your insurance covered? Um, how do you get certain procedures? If not, who do you call? Um, because I will be that bitch of a Karen on, on the phone and I will be like, how about you get me on this phone with somebody that knows something? Because I need to yeah. take care of my, my, my health care because you are your best advocate at all times. And so I really started out with my transition. And then whenever I moved up to Rhode Island, um, I started getting involved with some wonderful organizations like TGI Network of Rhode Island. Um, at the time, I was also a, a patient at Thunder Mist Medical Center. And um, I was really just super interested in how do I utilize my transition and my experience to help give other people the tools to be able to access their surgeries, their hormones, what they need more efficiently and cost effective. And so um, part of that also meant like educating doctors. And so whenever I, um, when I was in, in Rhode Island, I actually was doing uh, some informal presentations or some informal panels um, to not only the local community, but also at uh, Brown University, um, their medical school. I was doing some panels with uh, our upcoming future of doctors and saying, how do you make healthcare more trans inclusive? What do we need uh, from doctors? How do we, how can you help us feel seen? How can you advocate for us on the insurance level and on the policy level? And so from that, um, I've been doing some of the work uh, in the community, but also in my current role at work, you know, for example, we were in charge of trying to, I work in HR and we were trying to figure out like, how could we get the most bang for our buck with an insurance policy? And so I was doing policy analysis on, you know, gender affirming care, what's covered, how can we push the needle forward? How can we go back to these insurance companies and say, hey, we're really interested in bringing you on as our provider, but you're just missing the mark because we have a substantial LGBTQ population that works here. And in order for everyone to feel included and for us to uh, do our jobs appropriately in human resources, it means that we are consistently looking at everybody's needs and that includes our community. And so as a result, you know, working with my supervisor and working with this insurance company, we were able to kind of like, really kind of move the needle forward and, and push for better uh, transgender inclusions. And so a lot more is being included at my company, uh, which is really, really exciting. I know I didn't do it alone, um, but it's certainly exciting to be able to make that impact um, because that was a policy that also um, the, that that insurance company pushed out through Harvard Pilgrim and Harvard Pilgrim has now uh, pushed that policy out to all uh, policyholders in the Northeast. Um, so it's very exciting that they moved that timeline up and were able to uh, provide those accommodations. And we were able to do that for our employees. Uh, what uh, advice would you have for rural doctors? Um, obviously they're gonna encounter uh, people who maybe aren't as familiar with the terminology yet. They're not as familiar with what maybe a child is going through. Uh, they also hear a lot of the uh, community talk and they want to steer children to go certain ways. What advice would you have for a rural doctor that say they have uh, a boy come in that's, that has the true inclination that, that they're female? Like how, how does a doctor approach this with a young rural youth? Yeah, so I would say the the best the best way to think about this is um, if the child is coming to you, it's that means that they trust you, right? This is a really big deal and a really big thing, and so it's okay to take a moment and take stock of yourself and say, "Wow, this is a really heavy topic. It's a lot of decision making that, um, and, and some decisions like do make a difference and alter the course of your future." Um, but how, what, what could I provide in this moment that would give clarity to the situation? And so as a rural doctor, I think it's about keeping abreast of like your network, right? Because like I always say, there's always something left to love and there's always someone else out there that does not think in 
a bigoted way. And there are going to be therapists. And there's, I literally know a couple of therapists in little old Grayson County, Kentucky, that do take LGBTQ clients and help them through that process. But like being able to get connected, that is really, really challenging. And sometimes the first line of, or the first people that listen or hear this is a rural doctor. And so being able to know who your networks are, being able to like chat with local folks and be like, hey, I want to know like where you're at. Like, do you support? How can I refer patients to appropriate mental health care? And not in necessarily a gatekeeping way, but in a way that uh, provides discernment and reflection and analysis and saying like, okay, like help us understand child, little boy, little girl, little they, them, like what is going on in in your soul? What do you feel? Um, What's happening? And, you know, I think there's a lot of these bills that are coming out, particularly from Southern uh, legislators and lawmakers that aside from the fact that it being ridiculous, uh, (laughs) in my own opinion, um, I think there's this, this bit of people are so concerned that they're going to have access to hormones when they're like eight years old and they're going to have surgeries. Absolutely not. That is not a reality of the landscape of the WPATH standards of health. Um, So I would really encourage these rural doctors to also look at the WPATH standards of health care um, because those have been peer reviewed around the world. Um, And also like, don't fall into the trap of what is the rhetoric going on um, in legislative bodies because it can lead to a lot of disinformation, um, particularly around like puberty blockers. There's a lot of misinformation on puberty blockers and people, people don't even know that that's an option of like, you can postpone puberty for a little while until you can kind of become more of yourself and, and, and explore and, and do some things. That's perfectly okay. And as long as you're doing the appropriate blood work and you're doing the appropriate steps, And I'm not necessarily a doctor here, but as long as you're making a conscious effort to say, okay, we, I I may not know everything, but we can put a pause on things until we start to learn and discern more because case in point, I didn't know until I was much later and I had the words to be able to describe those things. And I think children are very intuitive and they do know how they feel. Um, But sometimes being able to say, okay, like, how do, how do I, as a child, like, do I have people that, that I can trust? And I think every child, especially transgender child, always want to know, am I lovable and am I capable? Am I, are people going to love me? And am I capable of going on this journey of doing magnificent things? And the answer is yes, there are people and it's about getting those resources to them. And I, th- I think it's important to, to acknowledge too, is that so many transgender youth seek suicide as an option versus any other ways. You know, a lot of times they're shunned, even if they, they are, they're caught dressing up or they come out to any other family, you know, there's a huge stigma uh, attached to that. And, you know, there, so many of the trans youth are suicidal. You know, and I think as a parent, you know, you really need to take take um, notice of this, you know, that, that that is a huge, huge implication. You know, as, as a parent, you want your children here. You know, I don't care, you know, what, what form my children take as long as they're here on this earth and I can still love them. Uh, and I think all, all parents really need to take uh Take notice of that, you know, be aware of that. You know, it is it is a huge the dysphoria is huge. You know, as women, as as people, we find body image such a huge issue. You know, I, we as women, we, we worry about five, 10, 15 pounds. We worry about Botox, hair color, all these things. Could you imagine what it's like? As- as as gay men, we worry about those same things. So <laughs> you, can't, you, can't. you can't escape it. <laughs> yeah. We worry about those same things. But to actually feel like your body is you're in the wrong body, that you aren't the right gender. I mean, that's the ultimate. Yeah. 
you know, because, you know, yeah. I have pride, you know, because I was depressed over this or that, you know, I felt, you know, that whole postpartum thing after you have a baby and your body is just a big mess, you know, to, to actually go through something as serious as gender, gender dysphoria is huge. Uh, and the mental uh, stress that you take on with that, you know, I think we need to be more cognitive of, of the effects of that as, as human beings, not just as parents, right. but as human beings, you know. And I, I will say this because you brought up an amazing point that I always like to highlight whenever it comes up, and that is at, they've done a ton of research on this, and the single single most thing that prevents suicide in transgender teens and adults is one supportive parent. It increases by about 80% if there's one supportive parent involved. So one thing I want to point out uh, since we're on the doctor subject is I always encourage doctors and therapists that are in rural areas to actually go out and tell businesses and people in the community that they support and that they're going to be affirming if they have children come in, if they even have adults come in that are LGBTQ. And the reason for that is, is every doctor has to be so supportive based on what's called for in the medical profession. But there's a difference between that in a rural area and someone who's going to actually help you and agree with you and understand what you're going through. And so it's so important, especially in rural communities where we don't have a lot of LGBTQ doctors and therapists to actually at least state we are affirming. Um, I, I do the same thing with churches. If you're a church that is affirming, we need to know that. There's a difference between affirming and toleration. So um, that's one of the things I just like to bring up. I do want to talk a little bit more about uh, the mother's viewpoint of you've had someone go through transition in your life. I know you said you wrote a letter um, to kind of help yourself through that. What type of fears and things did you have to go through? I mean, this is a medical procedure of, of a loved one, um, a, a big medical procedure of a loved one that you're going to go through. How did you stay supportive through that? Well, I will say that she was probably worried that I would just become more stunning and beautiful than she ever imagined. <laughs> True. True. Uh, well, I mean, I, I really, I leaned on my medical professional and, and my therapist uh, just because, you know, I only had so much space and time to prepare because in my mind, I'm like, okay, we, she kept, she said, this is the target date. And I was like, okay, maybe this will happen and maybe it won't, you know, because, you know, people change their mind. And, you know, and maybe that was a little bit of hopeful, you know, um, I don't know, wishful thinking in my part. Because, you know, this is something that's permanent. Once you take things away, you just can't magically put them back. My mom couldn't handle if I told her I was going to get a tattoo. So if I ever told her I was going to transition, I don't know how she would handle, period. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, like, and so. I don't do well with hospitals. There's a whole lot of, like, trauma-based stuff there, too. So I'm like, I went, when, when, we, when I knew we were going through with this, and, and I was going to be there. I was that mom. I was going to New York City because she had the very best doctors in the world. And that eased my yeah. mind because she had blue... Blue Bond. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Blue Bond Langner and Dr. Zhao at NYU. Yeah, the best doctors in the world. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to New York City. I'm a country mouse going to the big city. I, I And I have anxiety out the wazoo right now. Uh, so my doctor gave me a little medication <laughs> to help me through that. I'm not going to, you know, if you need it, lean on it. It's what I Okay. Yeah. So, um, had a little medication to help me through the day. The those uh, about three days. I needed a little something to get through the hospital, and you know, uh, it, it really did help. You know, uh, because you know, like I said, I had I have issues with hospitals. Anyways, hospitals not a good thing for me. Uh, but you know, I researched. I watched, and probably not. I don't know if it's a good, bad thing. I watched videos. I wanted to know what they were doing to my child exactly. I watched videos. I wanted to know exactly what was happening. Uh, 
and you know what that was going to look like. Uh, was there ever a point in which Kaylee did start having those doubts in which you actually had to help her process? Any that was her. I, I'm early to better that night before she had those doubts and she, she expect the, expressed them to her sister. And I'm glad I wasn't a part of that process. And I'm, I'm, I'm honest, if nothing else, I will tell you, I'm honest. I'm glad I wasn't a part of that process because I don't know how I would have handled that. Kaylee, how did you work through that? Obviously, this is a, a last minute moment of just, am I sure about this? And it's a huge decision. So I, I completely can understand that thought process. Yeah, I, I think... So I also knew um, kind of her own grieving process. And I knew that um, if I told her, it would just be really hard on her. So that was my own little bit of like, I don't want to make things harder than they already are for my mama. But I will say that um, in those last, like that that night before I had surgery, um, it was... I think there it wasn't necessarily a doubt of of should I go through with it or not. It was a fear. And I think we all have fear of the unknown of like yeah. we don't know what's gonna yeah. come out on the other side because I I only knew a handful of people that had surgery and went with Dr. Blue Bon Langner and you know they told me great things and great results, but like I had never had a major surgery in my life. I've never like no anesthesia, no nothing. And so, um, and so it was a very sleepless night. Um, but you know, I talked to my sister, my sister and I, we look very similar. Um, we also can like have a little bit of the telepathy thing and we can kind of, um, if we're not thinking it, we can, we can talk it out. And so she was really, really helpful throughout that whole process of at least getting me to sleep because at 5 a.m., um, we made a mad dash across the street to the operating room. I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to get what I want. I got to go. Um, I'm like, beauty sleep. I'm like, I I, yeah. I need a different kind of beauty sleep. I need to, I need to go get anesthesia. I need for this to happen. And um, I don't think anything could have prepared me for, I, I was so used to gender dysphoria. I don't think anything could have prepared me for gender euphoria. And I really got to kind of experience that mm -hmm. at the end. And I tell people all the time, gender dysphoria is like having that, that annoying rock in your shoe where, and you can't take your shoe off and you can't get rid of it, but it, you know, it's always there. It's always nagging. You're like, God, this is so annoying. I wish this would go away. And it consumes your brain space. And so after I had surgery, the amount of clarity and the amount of brain space that I got back to do things that were more important for me um, to focus on different goals was just life changing, honestly. And she's so much that's, happier. Yeah, that's... I mean, so much the focus for her life has just totally shifted. And, and you know, it, it's just remarkable to see the change, the mental change, the physical change. It, it's just been, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the woman that she has become and just very proud that it's made Christmas shopping so much easier when you can buy three Coach Ham bags. And, and I think that's a, a a common experience from what we have heard on this show and, and the different people we've interviewed is that uh, it is a, it's that euphoric uh, process there at the end. Um, I believe the statistic uh, now is that it's less than 5% have any sort of regrets um, after going through the transition process. I mean, that, that to me speaks volumes, that less than 5%, because you can't get 5% of people to agree on anything in this country. So less than 5%, you know, <laughs> so that's incredible. Uh, so we do a segment on this show called the Do's and Don'ts. Um, it is an opportunity to give some advice to rural youth out there uh, or people that are also in your situation. Um, I don't know what you all pick to do, uh, but that's where we leave it up to you to do some do's and don'ts on any topic of your choice. Yeah. So we were talking and sometimes the most awkward parts of transition is fashion. And so we're mm -hmm. some fashionistas. 
So we thought we would give some do's and don'ts of transgender fashion. Like when you're trying to figure out how to how to begin your transition, at least from a trans woman perspective. And like, a mother who <laughs> says you should get rid of the wig. Yeah, I, I made the 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 not so great uh, decision to get a pretty much a shake and go wig. Um, and I wore it in Arizona a lot and she wasn't cute. She wasn't cute, but I was feeling my <laughs> Lady Godiva fantasy. I was like, yes, just blonde curls and, and mm. all the, the, the cascading and there was no, so there was no cascading. <laughs> there, there was there was nothing greedy about her. You know, I it, it, not from that standpoint, but even as a gay man, we go through a lot of, of fashion changes. And my hairdresser one time goes, "Your natural color is always going to be the right color." <laughs> so, like you know, we go through all these different things that we you know want to try out. But so, what are the do's that you have for uh, fashion uh, starting out? Yeah. So I would say some do's are black is always classy. Black is always classy. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a do for everybody that 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 transcends the every culture. Yeah. I would also say you can't go wrong with a fit and flare dress, especially as you think about like if you're doing any sort of tucking or if you're feeling really dysphoric, it really helps. Um, it really helps you kind of avoid being in a negative mental space. So I love a good fit and player dress. I think, you know, it really, it really does look great on a lot of different folks and like, they're absolutely my favorite. Any other dudes? No white eyeliner. Don't listen. That's a don't. Ooh, don't. Okay. Oh, that's a don't. Sephora, it, like in certain, certain Sephora's, um, they do do transgender makeup classes. Yes. And they yes, really like well. score. that was me, but yeah, you don't need the white eyeliner. <laughs> you don't need the uh, you don't need the white eyeliner. But there are some real like Sephora treat people are actually trained. Even doesn't matter which one you go to or like what people's thoughts sometimes maybe. Um, all Sephora, all Sephoras do um, do uphold the transgender community and are happy to teach you how to do your makeup. And I had a lovely. A woman named Melora who did my makeup. Now I will say, if Melora is watching, I have since since ditched the white eyeliner, but <laughs> but I've kept a lot of different styles and a lot of different tips, and that really served me well. So don't be afraid to go uh, go to Sephora or go to one of these outlets. And and here's the thing too: like I have like a beard, I had things. And I was just open and honest with them, which can be really scary and vulnerable. But, you know, as someone that has been to those, to, to, to several Sephora's, I have been met with a lot of affirmation. So that's a good tip is you also don't have to spend anything there to get good help. Um, so I really think yeah. and support Sephora in that way. Sephora actually is one that uh, hires quite a few drag queens as well. So they're very supportive of the community in general. So say that I think as a mom one of the best things you can do to support your your daughters or or your your transies is is buy something gender appropriate like you know I you know the the love that I put into Kaylee's first female gifts those those lady gifts those the the handbags and the makeup and to see the the reaction on her face when she got her makeup, when she got her handbag, was just amazing. And I think, I think just seeing that as a mom, you know, seeing the yeah. the happiness on there. Not that gifts mean a lot, but when when you find something gender affirming for your child that that has been typically, you know, harder, oh, yeah. you know, it just makes a difference. Yeah. And something I would also add as a as a do, um, definitely, if you're not in a space and you don't feel quite safe um, transitioning, um, or you you just don't have those resources, sometimes it's even doing the small things that really bring you joy. 
And so don't be afraid to paint like your toenails. Don't be afraid to do some of those things that even though people may not be able to see it, you know, deep down what you're doing and what it gives you. Um, I think those are definitely do's and there, there is yeah. no, there's no bad nail polish when you're trying to focus on, on your well-being at all. I think that's something that's becoming pretty universal though. I, I think even straight males, a lot of times are now wearing fingernail polish. I have to brag on my, uh, one of my best friends who is a straight male. And the other day he like sends me a picture of, of him in nail polish. And I'm like, okay, all right, rock on, you know? Like, so yeah. Were there some more don'ts or was that everything? Or do we just need to put no white eyeliner? No white oh. eyeliner and no shaking go wigs. No shaking go wigs. No shaking go wigs. All right. I'm telling you, don't be afraid to to rock a, a feminine shortcut. You know, I think I think a lot of trans uh, females think that automatically think that long hair is is the quintessential female thing. But you know, sometimes you have to let that grow out, and don't be afraid to cut it. Don't be afraid afraid of that that cute little feminine pixie cut i would rather see that than a shake and go wig any day i'm like girl you got it that wig's gotta go she got to go <laughs> she did not go she is properly stored for sentimental purposes like i, I, support, I support that it's like, it's a we had a changing important. of the guard with this <laughs> with actual oh, hair rough. i'm like honey i was that mom i will always be blatantly bluntly honest she got to go I completely get it. That's uh, even in gay world with our fashion changes over time. I think there was one point in which my mom was like, we're just going to make a quilt out of these old t-shirts that you were wearing for a while that you went through this like wild phase here. So yeah, I get it. It's, you know, but you got to keep it for sentimental reasons for sure. That's 100%. I know that there's a very funny story um, related to, I believe, a relationships involving Paul. Well, we found there... we thought of a better one. Okay, well, if if you could tell both of them, I want to hear both of them. <laughs> so... oh, my. Do we have the gay stories galore in our family? Oh, oh, that that's the segments we call heap of trouble. Uh, um, so we're gonna let you all tell us a little bit about the moments that y'all got into some heaps of trouble uh, being a part of the LGBTQ community. I think it should children. be. I think it should be God gobs of trouble because it's, it's, it's beyond heap. It's beyond heap. So now I can't say this. This story actually was pinned on Kaylee. Kaylee was not the guilty party, and me knowing because I knew from a young age that Kaylee was gay. Knew I'm like, there's no way this is possible. But I'll let Kaylee tell you the story. But just keep in mind, I knew. At the time that this was being pinned on poor little Kaylee, that Kaylee was as gay as gay could be. <laughs> yeah. So it actually it's it starts with uh, my father, and my father had is a is an automotive man. He he loves his auto worlds. He loves Craigslist, looking at like all the different cars, things like that. Well, back in the day, we had a family laptop. They got passed around. You know, mom was doing some of her schoolwork on it. Dad would be doing some of the, the actual looking on Craigslist for different cars. Now, I have never touched the family laptop because I could not be bothered to do anything on the family laptop because if I was going to be sneaky, I'm better and I'm sneakier than that. Right. So... <laughs> Um, so what happens is, um, my mother, um, calls me into the living room one day and she apparently went through the browsing history. We hit the back button one too many times. One too many times. Oh, um, goodness. and there was a lot of, um, platonic ads, uh, or lots of sexual women, um, that were like posting, looking for a really great time. And also there was a posting that had my photo on it. 
It was a photo of me saying what I was looking for. Now, mother calls yes. me into the living room to discuss this. And I am literally like, woman, I don't think you, like, let's, let's think critically <laughs> about this. And I hadn't come out at the time, but I was like, we can put context clues together. Who is on Craigslist? Because it's not the gay, it's not the gay progeny at all. I'm like, oh no, I'm not on, I'm not on Craigslist. I'm not, like, I'm doing other things. I am, like, doing math homework and, and trying to, like, finish all the seasons of Will and Grace. I don't know. But I certainly wasn't on Craigslist. And so, um, and so my mother there was like, hmm, ain't that something? So we have a conversation with our father on why is there an ad of me? And there's a lot of soliciting women that are interested in me. Keep in mind, I was also in high school, so. Uh, mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they were they, like, what's going on here? And he says, well, I was just looking. Uh, I was trying to I was trying to set up my son uh, with somebody because he's alone all the time and he doesn't want to date no girl. So I'm trying to set some stuff up. What? <laughs> Upon further, oh invest- oh my God. God. Upon further okay. investigation, we found some not so nice photos in the inbox. Oh, my goodness. That's a lot to take uh, in. <laughs> like, you're telling me. So, <laughs> I have photos of me online. So, so I was like, what? <laughs> On the ground. Oh, oh my gosh. Lord, yeah. And he, that's how I called so my mother's you, divorce. How did you deal? <laughs> I mean, how did you deal with this issue? This is like a serious, like, whoa, he's putting your kid's picture online. <laughs> like, I didn't care. I knew child was gay i mean i mean you just had to check your bases oh, of like goodness. are you just a double check so, like i'm like eh, I, I know. so what was what was the conversation with him then like did you have to be oh, like look dude, it's, not, it's not gonna I'm like uh, you know and this is on a sunday morning before the baptist service oh my, oh, my goodness oh. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah i'm like all right. Well, that's a definite heap of trouble. I've never heard of anybody's like dad putting them on Craigslist to try to find them a woman. So this is that that one takes the cake on uh, parental action, I guess. So. The, the, oh, the, the Paul story, though. Now, the, well, we have a couple Paul stories because Paul we'll condense it. Well, which which one do you want to tell? <laughs> the one where he didn't know who you were or the one where he was giving you dating advice? <laughs> The dating advice was better. So th- this is a throwback to, to gay days, not trans days. So, um, which sometimes run concurrently. But the back back then, I so my step grandpa, um, we are having a family get together, and so um, we affectionately call him Paul. So Paul uh, got really curious. And he started asking a couple questions. And so he asked the question. He was like, well, you know, like, are you going on on date at any dates lately? And I was like, well, not really, Paul. And I, I hadn't come out to Paul at all. Everybody uh, else in the family but Paul. Everybody it's, else knew but Paul. There's a lot to unpack with Paul. You'd have to know Paul. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot with Paul. So Paul is like, okay, well, um, well, like, just so you know, I've got some good dating pointers if you ever need them. He's like, I, I've got, I, I know how to land them. And so, oh goodness. So my uncle had to take him aside. And this is, by the way, this is also my uncle's bar story that he tells people. <laughs> <laughs> he takes Paul aside and says, "Well, you know that Kaylee's gay, right?" And then all of a sudden, you could see the wheels start turning. And all of a sudden, he pops his head back. He's like, "I take it back. I have no idea. I have no. I have no pointers for you. I have none whatsoever. I. I had no idea." <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I, every oh, time, quick change of events. So I, every time I ask him, "Hey, Paul, do you have any pointers for me now?" <laughs> he still doesn't have any pointers for me. And then whenever I came out as trans, bless his heart, he didn't even know who I was when I showed up to a family gathering. He thought I was someone's girlfriend, and he just assumed that I was there uh, just to eat food, and he was going to accept me no matter what. So acceptance comes in all sorts of forms. Aww. Yeah. Well, that's a good, that's a good ending on there. You on that. That's sweet. <laughs> At least you were invited to the table. He didn't know who you were, but you were you were invited. So that's a good southern charm right there. It's <laughs> oh goodness. Well, it's it's been a pleasure. I want uh, to offer you all a chance to give any other just last minute overall arching advice to rural youth, as well as talk about anything that you wanted to talk about that we haven't yet addressed on the show. Uh, and then we're going to go into our final pot of gold questions uh, to wrap things up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess my, my my thing would be there's always going to be somebody out there that'll listen and be there for you. Uh, even if it's not your mom, your dad, there will be somebody in the community. And uh, if you ever need anybody, reach out to me, social media, to me, and I will listen. I'll be your shoulder to cry on uh, there for you. I'll, I've been there for many uh, LGBT plus uh, youth and will let, be there for as many as I can just to lend a shoulder to cry on or a piece of advice or a hug. You know, sometimes it, all you need is a hug. And I, if, if I had to leave one lasting piece of advice, I would say that, um, that like, that I, and I've already said it before, but there's always something left to love. Like yes. there's, there really is always something left to love. And I am not just trans, I contain multitudes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's always this balance, right, of, of not being tokenizing and, and also being visible. And so for folks that don't feel like they can be visible right now, um, there's always something left to love. And there are people out there that love you because you're trans. They love you because you're an artist, you're a designer, you're um, an engineer, it doesn't matter. And so um, you are more complex than you know, and there are people out there that love you more than you know. Yeah. That's some great advice from both of you. Um, I appreciate so much. Like You've given some amazing advice on this show, both from both perspectives. Um, and I think it's so incredible that we've had you on the show. Um, we do a final segment called the Pot of Gold. Um, it's a chance for you to ask me any question you want uh, me to answer, and then I'll wrap up. And I'm going to actually ask both of you a question independently, um, one of which I'm going to have our producer ask uh, as a mother um, of an LGBTQ uh, person. I think it would be a great chance for her to ask a final question to the other mom. Um, my question uh, is going to be... Um, you're obviously living now in Rhode Island. You've moved away. Um, would you ever consider moving back to a rural area? And what trials and tribulations would you have to prepare yourself to face? She has been on my case for years to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... So for me, I, I really think that it's it's the multitudes, right? It's not just the fact that I'm transgender, but what I, I've really shifted my career trajectory as well. I used to work in higher education, which kind of led me to bopping around all over the place. And uh, now I actually work in the cannabis industry. I work in medical cannabis. So that's a whole other layer of, of, of things. Um, but I will say that some of the trials and tribulations really do evolve, revolve around, you know, I think about a lot of these bills and a lot of the things that people are trying to pass are um, people are trying to fight uh, and be contentious about who is allowed to be visible and take up space. And so yeah. Yeah. if I were to come back, I would want to come back in a capacity where I could be visible and make a really substantial difference particularly um, because my motto is, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I would rather be at the table um, having really tough conversations with lawmakers and, and making a difference. 
And I also know within myself and in my resources that I'm not necessarily in that space right now because I'm still healing from a lot of like the surgeries and a lot of the the stuff that kind of comes with that. And being in a good place mentally to take on a fight like that is is a big deal. Um, And I'm trying to do it in my own small pockets in Rhode Island, um, but also trying to support my mom with things like with the River Park um, and being able to, by extension, do some things in some small ways from a distance. Um, So I'm always happy to work with organizations in Kentucky, even though I'm further away. um, I do a lot of diversity, equity and inclusion consulting and um, a lot of these kind of uh, opportunities as well. So I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility, um, but I really think that um, there's a lot of healthcare and there's a lot of just complexities to it. And, um, and I think eventually she'll see more of me. Um, How could she not like, Incredible what you're doing. LGBTQ advocacy, especially right now, especially in the transgender uh, discussions that are being made across the whole nation. Um, I admire what you're doing. And, the re- you know, I know it's incredibly traumatic just as a gay male to go through some of the types of trials and tribulations we've gone through with our senators and, and various things to see what's happening every day right now. This is the next big battle for LGBTQ equality. Um, so I, you've got a hundred percent my support of everything you're doing. And I appreciate what you're doing for all these kids out there that, that listen to our show. Um, one of the reasons why we're on a podcast and, and have our videos on Spotify is so that kids that don't necessarily want to show up in those, uh, back spaces on, on the internet, you know, go into some site or something and get caught that way. Most parents don't know about Spotify and, and how to find a video podcast, uh, kids figure it out, and that's why we do what we do. So thank you for doing that. Um, I will allow you all to ask a question to me, and then, Amy, what I want you to do is type in your question in the chat so that I can say it since you're not recorded. So, All right, what is your all's pot of gold for me? Okay, so it is pride season, and I am quite the musical kind of gal. So I'm curious to know, Curtis, what is on your pride playlist right now? That is okay. So there's a lot of things on my pride playlist. Um, But for Kentucky and a pride, Tovlo is coming. Um, Tovlo is one of my like all time faves. So I've been listening to her like every album she's ever had for like the past month already. Um, I will say Todger Call is generally on my playlist. Um, I love Parade and a lot of those that he released specifically for uh, Pride. It just gives you that, like, pumped up energy. Um, what else is on my playlist? Um, I've slowly started gathering a little bit of country songs here and there because they're starting to release more uh, Pride-related country songs. Um, actually, and I will give this person a shout-out. Um, his name, I believe, let's see, Tyler Rain, but I want to know the name of this song, uh, that I have been jamming to, uh, Tyler Rain just released We Are One, um, and that's a really good one, I will say, put that on your playlist if it's not on your playlist already. Nice. What should be on my playlist? I know this is a bonus question. (laughs) Reverse pot of gold. Um, for 20 points. Yes. Uh, I like, I'm a sucker for the oldies. Like I, I love, um, in my arms by Kylie Minogue, like Ooh, so thanks. good. I've been bopping to that lately. Um, I have been bopping to, um, uh, there has been some Tadra call. I really like, yes, my Tadra call, yeah. Yeah. um, because I feel like mm-hmm. some people need to hear that and hear that clear. Um, so the, I've been bopping to some Todd, um, but I will also say that I, I listen to a lot of the classics like Cher, totally a Cher fan. Um, don't care who knows it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, you brought up Kylie Minogue, and I'm going to tell this story really quick. Amy will love it because we just spent an entire weekend with one of my best friends, Daniel Hughes. Uh, we call him Razzle Dazzle. Um, but he, he likes to, you know, party a lot. There's nothing wrong with that, but he likes to party. Um, and we were at a, like a 
a, we were actually down at Gay Days uh, for an event, and there was like this wine tasting and stuff. Well, by the end of this, he was feeling good, and uh, he, <laughs> we were like, Daniel, what are you doing? And so he starts running up to the stage and to the DJ so that he could get the DJ to play Time Bomb by Kylie Minogue. That is like his all-time favorite song ever. And the DJ's like, you got to get down. And he goes, you play Kylie Minogue now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Kylie apparently has a place in people's like pride list for sure. <laughs> I love it. So. All right. Well, I've got this wonderful question uh, submitted from Amy, our coordinating producer. Um, as an extra ally mom, according to my 18 year old daughter, how do I get her to accept me? Her friends do, but she doesn't want to be seen with me at Kentucky Enterprise pride and or play in Louisville. Um, even though the other, other LGBTQ kids in the community ask, uh, Amy to lead the pride drive, uh, which she did this past year. Um, and various other things that Amy has been supportive in the LGBTQ community. I mean, she is the co-producer of this show. I don't know how you could be more supportive. Uh, but she's dealing with that teenage daughter, you know, that's like, like she knows that her mom supports her, but doesn't want to be seen with her, that sort of thing. So how do you, how do you come to terms with that? I don't, <laughs> I really, Amy, I really don't think it's a, I think it's an age thing because my girls didn't like me until they were in their twenties. That's true. <laughs> I think I think it's an age thing. I think once they get like 20, 21, she'll start liking you again. Uh, they only like you when at that age is when you have money. So and when you run out of yeah. money, then you're really they really don't like you. Uh, but I so I, I would I would also add um for Amy's Amy's daughter, um, that d don't be so hard on your mom. Absolutely. Like, don't be so hard um, because mm -hmm. eventually you get to my age at the age of 30 and you're like, oh my God, I've become my mother. And that's not necessarily <laughs> a bad thing. It just happens. It's genetics. It, it is. And, mm -hmm. and you will learn that big hair is a good thing. Uh, and yeah. I, I just think it's it's an age thing, but you know, Amy's daughter, I don't know her name, but honey, you are blessed. So Very. blessed to be loved by somebody that accepts you for you. You should, you, sh you are just so blessed. You should love your mama, just love her Very. up. She just, you're just so blessed because not a lot of mamas are just like, no, 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 not my child, not my child. To, to have somebody that loves you unconditionally, that is the biggest, that's the biggest thing you could ever want or ask for on this earth. And it tra transcend, transcends anything in life. Yeah. That is some beautiful advice. Um, I keep telling Amy that uh, it's going to change real quick whenever her daughter actually sees us at Pride and sees us in the VIP tents where it's air conditioned <laughs> and you've got a private bathroom. It looks real hard and outside that tent. All these kind of things. Yeah. And I, you know what? And she's going to come over and she's going to be like, can you get us in this VIP area? And I'm going to be like, who are you? I don't know what you're doing. You so. <laughs> but I'm, it's going to change real quick when that happens. Mark my word. But well, it has been such a pleasure to have you all on the show. Obviously, y'all have brought all the sass and southern charm that uh, this show was made for. Um, you have both lived beautiful stories. I love so much whenever we have accepting moms that come on the show and and just or right into our show. That's one of the greatest highlights for me is whenever a mom and I, I'm going to get teary eyed. So <laughs> I'm not going to go into this deeply, but um, we've had so many moms right into our show talking about how this show has transformed them, has taught them the things that they need to do to be more accepting of their children. Um, and that's why, honestly, I think this show is going to be so important for our audience because I would say probably 35, 40 percent of our audience is actually straight parents that have come on to listen and learn about their children, which is incredibly empowerful if you just think about that alone, that this many parents are wanting to find out and learn and be supportive of their children as much as they can. So, 
Thank you both for being Thank on. Thank you for show. having it. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you guys. Yeah. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Don't forget to come on back now. I know we all love a little vibration, so if you are not already, go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. And we will surprise you on occasion with a new release vibration in your pocket. But in the meantime, if you find yourself alone or crossing new horizons along the rainbow trail and you need a friend or even a laugh, to get you through those dark and stormy nights. Holler on out to us at www.weatheringrainbows.com where you can find shelter in the blogs, videos, and other episodes that will hopefully keep you out of a whole heap of trouble. So until next time, y'all, giddy up, be true to yourself, and make the best of life. And wherever the wild tracks may lead you, may the rainbow Always touch your shoulders.